There are two questions which my friends continually ask me. One is how I came to write Sherlock Holmes, and the other is why I became a spiritualist and about spiritualism generally. With regard to Sherlock Holmes, I was, when I wrote it, a young doctor, and had been educated in a very severe and critical medical school of thought, especially coming under the influence of Dr. Bell of Edinburgh, who had most remarkable powers of observation. He prided himself that when he looked at a patient, he could tell not only their disease, but very often their occupation and place of residence. Reading some detective stories, I was struck by the fact that their results were obtained in nearly every case by chance. I accept, of course, Edgar Allan Poe's splendid stories, which, though only three in number, are a model for all time. I thought I would try my hand at writing a story where the hero would treat crime as Dr. Bell treated disease, and where science would take the place of chance. The result was Sherlock Holmes, and I confess that result has surprised me very much, for I learn that many schools of detection, working in France, in Egypt, in China, and elsewhere, have admittedly founded their system upon that of Holmes. To many, he seems to be a real person, and I have had numerous letters from time to time addressed to him from all parts of the world on the most quaint requests, including what was virtually an offer of marriage. His autograph also is much in demand. Now as to the more serious subject. The result of my medical education in the days of Huxley and Haeckel was to make me agnostic in matters of religion, and certainly I had no belief that we survived death. I've always, of course, kept my mind open to new ideas, for the day a man's mind shuts is the day of his mental death. In 1887, some curious psychic experiences came my way, and especially I was impressed by the fact of telepathy, which I proved for myself by experiments with a friend. The question then arose, if two incarnate minds could communicate, is it possible for a discarnate one to communicate with one that is still in the body? For more than twenty years I examined the evidence, and came finally to the conclusion beyond all doubt that such communication was possible. I could give hundreds of illustrations to prove my point, but I can only refer you to the literature of the subject. I took my proofs from actual personal experiments, as well as from the work of such a great man as Sir William Crookes, Myers, Dr. Russell Wallace, and others. The full importance of the matter did not come home to me until the war, when all the world was asking, where are our dead boys? And getting such unsatisfactory answers, both from the churches and from science. Then it was that my wife and I felt that our knowledge on the subject was of enormous importance, and that we could answer this universal question. Twelve years of our lives have now been spent in trying to impart our knowledge to others, in the course of which we have travelled 75,000 miles and we have addressed a quarter of a million of people. The work has now been too much for me. It has weakened my heart and I am temporarily disabled. But perhaps by this record I could say a word to a new and worldwide audience. That word is that there is nothing in this new knowledge to destroy the foundations of your present belief, but, on the contrary, that it adds a knowledge and a feeling of security such as no other system of philosophy has been able to give. The basis of all religions is that we live after death, and the proving of the truth of this basis is to my mind the most essential work in this age of perplexity and materialism, 
when good and earnest men honestly doubt whether death is not the end. People ask, what do you get from spiritualism? The first thing you get is that it absolutely removes all fear of death. Secondly, it bridges death for those dear ones whom we may lose. We need have no fear that we are calling them back, for all that we do is to make such conditions as experience has taught us will enable them to come if they wish and the initiative lies always with them. They have many times told us that they could not come back if it were not God's will, and that it makes them intensely happy to be able to help and to comfort us, to tell us about their happy life in that world to which we are in our turn destined to come. People say that only trivialities come through, in effecting a recognition, this has some truth. If, for example, some dear one returned to me, he could not prove his identity to me by discussing high matters. But he could do so by reminding me of past private experiences known only to himself and to me. But in contact with higher spirit people, we do get lofty religious teaching and most inspiring knowledge. The press, unfortunately, usually only notices spiritualism when fraud or folly is in question. Fraud and folly do exist, as in everything. But the press does not mention, as a rule, the thousands of cases where consolation and proof have been brought to suffering hearts. We bring important facts, new facts, which will revolutionize the whole thought of the human race, both in religion and in science. It is the great question of the future, and it will end by making religion a real living thing, so that all doubt of God's goodness or of the destiny of mankind, will be forever banished, since we shall each be in actual touch with what is higher than ourselves, and the communion of saints will at last be an established fact.